Woo, that's right, Daddy. We're gonna do it, do it, do it to you. Work my body, baby. Ah, oh, yeah. Come on, check it out. It's all live, and it's all happening right here at Show World Center. <laughs> If I had wanted to, I could have marketed myself the unofficial mayor of Times Square because there were people who used to call me that. The type of journalism that I did, I was more interested in writing about people. Oh, we're going to make you come, come, come. And about the extremes of people living at the edges of life in Times Square. My name is Josh Allen Friedman, and I was the only writer in New York amongst 50,000 writers in New York, covering Times Square as a beat in real time back in the 1970s and 80s when it was good old New York. We moved into the city in 1972 from Long Island. 16 years old, I was absolutely fascinated and frightened by the very, very mysterious and dangerous area of Times Square, which at that time was populated by 1,200 hookers every night along 8th Avenue in the early 1970s. My first day in New York City, I go down with my brother Drew to 42nd Street and 8th Avenue to the Child's Pancake House, I think it was called. <laughs> We're sitting there having breakfast in the morning. It was dirty, fresh air, but it was delicious. The buses and the fumes and all the hookers were like off from work and it's like seven in the morning and the pimps were all like crowded into booths. The building we lived in had a lot of a profession that no longer exists and they're called elevator men and they would drive your elevator. When I was 16 years old, I was kind of lonely and didn't have any friends in New York yet, so I became good friends with all the elevator men and would go down to Times Square with them and see all the hookers and the danger and the excitement. But in any case, I went with the elevator men to Times Square where I got to understand the whole hooker culture and stuff through seeing them. These guys would spend their meager salary at the racetrack and on hookers and end up being broke. But that was their life. And I aspired at, at the age of 16 to become an elevator man myself, but the entire profession was made obsolete by the push of a button. So there's no more elevator men and there's no more Times Square. At the time that I came into the magazine business in the late 70s, I guess it was right after Woodward and Bernstein had a huge success with all the president's men, and fiction writing went way down the totem pole so that magazines were assigning journalism. My favorite magazine at that time, when I was 18, was Screw Magazine. It was like Mad Magazine with a penis, or with an erect, with an erection. It was hysterically funny. I remember the first time I went into the office of Screw in 1976. I didn't even know if I was old enough to write for them yet. I was 20. I picked up my first assignment. Nobody wanted to cover Times Square. It was too dangerous. Most writers in New York would have felt it was beneath them or they were embarrassed. Here is New York at its worst, and yet it's so interesting and exciting, and it's all mine have it all to myself? No other writers are coming here? I was in the music business as a record promoter before then. Uh-huh. And you would never take your clothes off in front of an in audience of an before? Audience and before. what was it like the first time that you removed your... Well, my lips kept on shaking a lot. My knees were moving sideways, and I had no moisture in my throat, uh -huh. and I couldn't even speak. They didn't and come was... to hear you speak, though. No, they didn't. It was an upside-down world. Anything goes. Sexually, thousands of women coming down to make, you know, including women working the peep shows who were nurses, who were sometimes school teachers, and lots of junkies, and a whole mix of women who would secretly come down and earn money. The most beautiful girls you'd ever seen would be working on the streets. And the common currency of Times Square was called the Show World token. By a handful of tokens going to a private little booth, began at about a minute's time for a quarter, and then it gradually became 30 seconds time. And you have to keep those quarters coming or keep those tokens coming, or big bouncers will bang on the door. And at some point in 1978, the windows in the rising curtains disappeared, so there was an open window. So every form of prostitution that could be performed through a porthole occurred in the peep shows all throughout Times Square. 30 seconds of paradise. It took me years to gain the confidence of the citizens of this neighborhood 
And in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, Times Square was its own unique neighborhood with its own citizenry, with its own people. The type of journalism that I did, I was more interested in writing about people and about the extremes of people living at the edges of life in Times Square. I don't want to sound fancy or anything, but I seem to have been more interested in that than just reporting on sex, 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 like most of the other magazines would do. Not to say that the sex part wasn't really amazing. It was couldn't believe people lived like that. Like, how could you do this for a living? People would see the column, would read it, you'd hear about it every day. And little by little, people started to like me. Owners would come out of the shadows. The very top guys who really owned everything were mobsters. Robert D. Bernardo was the protector of Screw. He was like the number three or four man in the Gambino family. So we under Screw, nobody could me fuck with us. Nobody could mess with us. Screw was prominently displayed alongside the New York Post and the Daily News in those days. It was those three papers out front of every newsstand in New York. Hard to believe, but the mafia had control over newspaper distribution, so that's the way it was. Being young, you know, in your early 20s and having access to all these porn starlets and burlesque queens and stuff was really exciting. I didn't do anything insane. I love girls. AIDS doesn't exist yet. Take it from there, figure it out. The leading burlesque hall in Times Square back in the 70s and 80s was the Melody Burlesque. It was like the dying days, the last days of the real burlesque where showgirls would come out and do a routine. Like Gypsy, they invented the lap dance. <laughs> You'd think, like the Heimlich maneuver, you'd think somebody would have done a lap dance at some point during the history of human civilization. Apparently it started at the Melody Burlesque in the 1970s, the so-called lap dance. So Al Cronish was the first guy to present porn stars on stage at the very beginning of when porn films just began out in public. He would book Jennifer Wells, I think she was the first one he ever booked, and Tina Russell, and he was the first guy to put them on stage. I remember the first time I went up to the Melody Burlesque, and I was scared to go up there. It was behind the door and all the lights and everything. And I was astounded to find a scene. There was a stripper named Valerie Lavender from England with a thick English accent who was like a vanity showgirl from like the 19th century or something with plumes and hats and everything. And she was popping ping pong balls out of her vagina into the mouths of men who were like seals, catching the balls. It was a world I had never seen. I couldn't believe existed. And there was like a hundred guys in the audience and they were going crazy over Valerie Lavender two of the co-owners of the Melody Burlesque they became real friends of mine where I would hang out in the back office. There were old boxers and old racetrack touts, old wrestlers, and then the girls would all poke their heads in and say, uh, get me out of here, ha 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 ha, they'd laugh and everything. But uh, the, a lot of the girls, a lot of the strippers loved it, and some of them hated it. But the ones who survived, who are now in their 60s and 70s, who I've kept in touch with somewhat, they remember with great fondness the owners, and they remember the fun of it rather than the negative aspects of it. And I remember it that way too, even though it was shabby and it was like the pits of show business, but oh my God, it was so much fun and it was still exciting. To me, everything was morally or ethically sound, almost, to my eyes. And the outside world seemed more corrupt. You know, the mainstream media always seemed a lot more corrupt than we were. Very few people were offended by what I wrote. Maybe a few were. People tend to like to have their story told, for the most part. Even club owners, guys who would not want to have too much light shined on them, suddenly came out to me. They had a certain respect for writers. If you weren't looking to just sensationalize their world and were taking it seriously, Screw and some of the publications around it represented the very last years of the so-called sexual revolution before AIDS came in and put a damper on everything and everything changed after AIDS. Places started closing. It would have been the mid 80s and everything was about to change and Times Square was about to be taken over by Disney and corporations and wiped out and my job was done. I knew that at the time. At some point I met my wife and everything settled down. Right from Screw, I became managing editor of High Times magazine. That's the extent of the debauchery.
And that's the way I've looked at Times Square. For me, when I was younger, I would gravitate every night to Times Square whenever I was lonely or sad or something, and somehow all that voltage is a lift. And I think there's something to that. The whole neighborhood is gone. There are no local people who live right in Times Square that I'm aware of the way they used to be. I understand that it needed to be gentrified and crime needed to be cleaned up. But why not leave one block, just one block, out of the 13 blocks of Times Square as a red light district and let these old burlesque places survive? Everybody needs a little decadence in their life to balance themselves out just a little bit. New York does not have that and is sorely missing the soulful kind of part of New York that I don't see exists anymore. And I'm talking like an old fogey to say that. In my day, we had so the soul of the city was, but it really was, it really was. cleaned up a lot. So the theater district is now a place I think where people do feel safe at night to come, whereas when I was growing up it was certainly an off-limits area where anything could happen. There's not any porno theaters like there used to be.